shower eyes up. Tonight, we are beginning the Congress, and what you get out of the Congress will depend on what you are expecting from the Congress. If you expect much, you are going to get much. If you expect revival, you are going to have revival. If you expect a change of your life and ministry, you are going to have that. And if you expect an inheritance from the Lord, you are going to get it. So I want to give you a chance to tell the Lord, what's your expectation? What do you want? What are you going to get out of the Congress? Are you expecting the deep revelations of the truth of the Word of God? Are you expecting revival? Are you expecting that God is going to open your eyes? The eyes of your understanding is going to challenge you and lead you in the way you ought to go. What do you expect? Are you going to allow him to do something in you that for years you have been dreaming of, expecting that this will be done? In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we bless your name for our being here. We know it's not an accident that we're here. We're here because you have determined and decided it. This is your plan. This is your purpose. And we know you have something in mind that you're going to fulfill. Therefore, Lord, we throw the doors of our hearts wide open. And we're asking that you speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. We're praying, O oh Lord, that we will not miss what you have for us. And that you will touch every heart, you revive everyone, and you broaden our vision in Jesus' name. We ask, O oh Lord, that you so pour your blessings upon us, that we will become channels and instruments of blessing in your hand, in Jesus' name. From tonight, speak to our heart and help us to know what to speak back to you. Touch every heart and life. Keep us awake as we listen to your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 17, here Paul the Apostle was writing to the church at Colossae. And as he concluded the epistle, the letter, his message, his exhortation to the believers, in the church at Colossae. Here is the concluding part, and it appears very important to the church as well as to this individual that he had the encouragement and the exhortation for. And this same word is important for you and for me. In verse 17, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it there is so much we can dig out of that verse because therein lies the very life and the ministry of every minister say to Archippus now today he's telling us to say to you that you will take heed to the ministry above any other thing, every other thing in your life, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received. 
And remember that you received that ministry in the Lord. And make sure that you fulfill the ministry. Fulfill it. As we begin this Congress tonight, we'll need to prepare our hearts that we will receive all that God has for us. It may be reawakening. It may be that he wants a new vision for you and for me. Or a new passion for the lost. Or maybe he wants to give us deeper Christian experiences. Or strength for greater service in the kingdom of the Lord. Whatever it is, we need to prepare ourselves. We are being called to the ministry. And our desire ought to be that we will fulfill the ministry that is do all things that he wants us to do so that in the last day we can hear the words well done our desire and purpose tonight and during the congress in fact throughout our lives on earth is to know and to do all that the Lord wants us to do, put it in a word, to fulfill our appointed ministry. Whatever we do in life, and however busy we may appear to be in Christian service, ours will be an eternal regret, an eternal sorrow, if we fail to fulfill our appointed ministry ministry and i believe that god has brought each of us here and each of us in the kingdom so that we'll discover the purpose stay within that purpose and fulfill the appointed ministry that's why we're beginning tonight with the challenge from the lord fulfilling our appointed ministry it's not just ordinarily fulfilling the ministry. It's not just being busy, but discovering your own appointed ministry and endeavoring to fulfill it. We'll touch on three points. Number one, perception. Number two, power. Number three, perseverance. Number one, perception of our appointed ministry number two power for the appointed ministry three perseverance in the appointed ministry one we have to know what it is we have to understand the length and breadth of it the extent the scope of it the depth and the height of the ministry that God is committing into our hands. You'll find as you have character study in the Bible, and you look at different lives of the people that God called in the past generations, that God was very specific as to what they were to do. He didn't just leave them guessing what they were supposed to do, he told them from the very beginning that this is the ministry he appointed for them. And he wanted them to spend the rest of their lives thinking, meditating, praying, planning, strategizing, carrying out, working, being busy in the appointed ministry. If I can give you some examples in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, reading from verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God was so very definite with Moses. He told him when to do it now. He told him where it is, Egypt. He told him the people grew, the tribes, the people that were involved, 
the children of Israel. He told him what he was to do with them. Bring them out. There might be difficulties. Bring them out. Pharaoh may refuse. Bring them out. The magicians might oppose you. Bring them out. The Israelites themselves might not even have any hope of escaping from the bondage of Egypt. Bring them out. He spelled it out very clearly for him what he was to do. That means then for Moses, he knew the appointed ministry. And nothing else will be a substitute. And the same thing the Lord is calling us to in this Congress. That you will have the right perception of the ministry that the Lord is calling you to. Maybe you have that conception already. If you didn't have that perception, maybe you wouldn't have been here. It's called you to do something. And the rest of your life is supposed to concentrate on doing exactly that thing. When he called Aaron, he also spelled out very clearly for him what he was to do. When he called the Levites, he spelled out for them. He explained it so very clearly they couldn't miss it. What they were supposed to do. And that you will find in every generation that God has always made it clear. In Numbers chapter 3, from verse 5. Numbers chapter 3, verse 5. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near, and present them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister unto him. And he shall keep his charge, and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation, to do the service of the tabernacle. It was very clear. And if you read on through to verse 12, you'll see how the Lord spelled out as to the details of what they were to do. It's in the generation in which we live today that many people breach about the bush and they work for years and decades that they still will not know what exactly they were supposed to do. But as we look at the word of God, it wasn't like that. The vision was so clear. The mission was so specific. And the passion that the people had was so hot. And they were so zealous because they knew the Lord had called them to something. And they put their whole lives behind what he called them to do. In Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 from verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city, every city and place, whither he himself would come. Again, here was a specific ministry. He sent them to every city and every place where he himself would come but they were to go before him and proclaim his name and proclaim his word in verse 2 therefore said he unto them the harvest really is plenteous is great but the laborers are few pray ye therefore the lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest that tells us that from that point on if anybody is going to have any appointed ministry, it is going to be laboring in the vineyard, in the harvest of the Lord. That means telling the lost how they can find salvation. That means planting churches. That means doing the work of the Lord that will bring souls into the kingdom. You see very often in our lives, our preoccupation with good things may hinder us from doing the best things appointed for us to do. There will be many people on the last day that will find that they didn't do the best they could do because they allowed 
good things to take the best from them. That's why it is not sufficient for the Christian to say, well, I am not doing evil. You may not be doing evil. It is not enough for you to say, my conscience is clear. And my conscience is bearing me witness that I am doing good where I am. That's not the point. The point is, is it possible? Is it likely that the good things you are doing hinder you from the best you could do? And it is not that you are comparing yourself with so and so. Because you may even be doing as much good as brother so and so is doing. Or sister so and so is doing. But are you doing the appointed thing? What he actually has called you to do? Can the people of God bear witness with your own heart that you are fulfilling the appointed ministry? Now when we talk of the appointed ministry, the Lord gives us that ministry in different ways. For example, when you think of Joshua, the Lord didn't call Joshua directly to tell him this is the appointed ministry. You know what he did? He told Moses. And Moses passed it on to Joshua. You remember in Exodus chapter 17 verse 14, the Lord said unto Moses, Write it for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. That vision was given to Moses. But it wasn't just appointed for Moses. It was appointed for Joshua. And eventually we're told in Deuteronomy that Joshua became a person that was full of the spirit of wisdom. Because Mos Moses had laid hands upon him. So that he'll be able to fulfill the ministry. The Lord called David. And again he gave him an appointed ministry. But please remember, it wasn't that David got it directly. God called Samuel and he sent him to the house of Jesse. And then the Lord anointed David. In that way, he called him to that appointed ministry. Elisha didn't appear to know what the appointed ministry was. But the Lord was talking to Elijah. Elijah was that discouraged prophet who was thinking, take me away. Let me die now. I think I've finished all I can do. Because after all, Ahab, Jezebel, Israel will not even listen. So there is no point of imposing myself and my ministry upon them. And God said, the better part of your ministry is still to come. And you will not be able to leave this vicinity until you anoint Elisha that will take your place. He will get the double portion and then he will carry out a double fold ministry. And so Elisha received the perception, the understanding of that appointed ministry through Elijah, even Paul the Apostle. You remember that they were ministering to the Lord and they were fasting. Then the Holy Ghost said, through someone in the congregation in the church at Antioch, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and they had laid hands on them, they sent them away. Can I just uh, tell you something there? If Paul called Saul of Tarsus, if he had remained in the church at Antioch, saying, well, that appointed ministry to go to the regions beyond, to do what he wasn't thinking about, because they just came to the service, and the word of the Lord came out that there is an appointed ministry for them. If he had said... There's so much teaching going on in Antioch. There is so much uh, work that needs to be done at Antioch. And therefore he decided, I would rather stay here. Rather than go to the faraway land and to the region beyond, he might have been preaching sound doctrine in Antioch, doing good in Antioch, helping people in Antioch, 
counseling in Antioch and straightening out things in Antioch. But the good things he was doing in Antioch will hinder him from doing the best he ought to do among the Gentiles. You see, that is what many people do not realize. They say, well, I'm busy here. I'm doing something here. So I don't think that if I go to another place, there are sinners who have not been saved here because all the sinners in Antioch had not been born again. They had not come into the gospel or into the kingdom. And yet God was sending Barnabas and Saul away from that place for an appointed ministry. For Titus, it was Paul that ordained him and commanded him and told him that the appointed ministry is this and this and this and he gave him instruction to carry it out. Well, think of us as a church. The Palai Bible Church. The church already knows the ministry that God has appointed for us. And you can put it in this way. Just about three things. Number one, exalt the Lord. We know that that's our ministry. That in everything we do, in what we say, in the life we live, we are to live to the glory of the Lord. So number one, exalt the Lord. Number two, edify the church. Obviously, that is the calling that we who are here, the ministers, the teachers, the preachers, the pastors, the evangelists, this is what we have to edify the church because he gave some apostles, he gave some prophets, he gave some evangelists, he gave some pastors and teachers. For what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But then number three, evangelize the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Exalt the Lord, edify the church, evangelize the world. So then we know the ministry. We know what he has called us to do. And each one of us here as part of the ministry. Here is the same thing that we are to do. If we were to spell it out very clearly, point by point, we'll say for us as individuals, number one, it is to preach the uniqueness of Christ and the redemptive atonement of Jesus Christ. Obviously, anyone here will know that whatever name you call your area, section of work in the church, it is that you will preach and proclaim the uniqueness of Christ and the redemptive atonement of Jesus Christ. Number two, it will be to teach the truth of Scripture to our congregations at every opportunity and to maintain the centrality of the scriptures. Obviously, anyone that names the name of Christ, anyone that says God has called him to be a minister, the ministry that God has called us to is to teach the truth, defend the truth, live by the truth, stand for the truth, support the truth, exalt the truth and trample upon error and do not have anything to do with false doctrine but you maintain the centrality of scriptures number three will be to train the workers for the evangelization of our communities because the laborers are few the field for harvest is so wide pray ye therefore to the god of the harvest that you will send laborers into the harvest field. Therefore, we are to train the workers. He gave, I quoted it to you before, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting, for the maturing, for the developing of the saints, for the work of the ministry. That means the development of the saints will lead to the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry by those who are trained will lead to the edifying of the body of Christ. So we're to raise up 
effective functioning local congregations. Number four, to develop capable, competent leaders who are truly called of God and truly and deeply taught in the scriptures. That's our calling. That's the appointed ministry. And if you look at your ministry, you look at what you are doing, are you preaching the uniqueness of Christ? Are you proclaiming the redemptive atonement of Jesus Christ? Are you teaching the balanced, full truth of Scripture? Are you maintaining the centrality of the Bible in your congregation? Are you training the workers to evangelize your community? Are you raising up effective, functioning local congregations? Are you developing capable, competent leaders who are deeply taught in Scripture and truly really called of God? Number five, obviously, our ministry should be that we are to develop strategies to evangelize each local government area of every state, of every region, and each province of every nation. Any nation where you are ministering, the Lord is calling you not just to stay in one location and be preaching for five years and seven years and ten years without ever going to suburb, without ever going to rural areas, and without ever developing strategies whereby you will evangelize every local government area, every province of the place where you are. Number six is to train indigenous or national believers to reach the unreached. Train indigenous and train national believers in Africa here, except the indigenous get involved with the work of proclaiming the gospel, preaching the word. It will never be done because we have more than 400 languages in Nigeria alone. And you as an individual, you cannot learn all the 400 languages. You cannot preach in all those languages. And the majority of people here, more than 65% of the nation, are illiterate. And therefore, if you are not training the indigenous, if you are not training the local people to actually get the work done, how are you going to reach the unreached? The same thing for our missionaries that have gone into various countries and nations. Part of the ministry is not just to teach Bible study, that's good as part of it. It's not just to have revival time, that's wonderful. It's not just to have a Sunday service, that's great. But part of your ministry is to look for those indigenous, those national believers, the native people, and give them all you have got. And Jesus did that effectively for three and a half years. He put everything he had in his disciples. And then he said, I can leave, you can continue. And they did it. In fact, he said, they will do more than he had done. That's the very ministry God has given you. It is not to suppress the people, cover up the people, so that they will not be able to do what you can do. It is to lift them up, dig them up, and train them up, do everything so that they'll be able to do what you can do and even go beyond what you can do. Number seven is to pray and lead the church to missionary vision with passion for the lost. Passion for the lost. You put that in every member of the congregation and you make sure that this one that every member of that church will know that it's not just a little church here. It's not just a little congregation here. They should know that there are people in faraway lands. There are people in nearby communities and tribes who still need to be reached with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will develop missionary vision in the church. Number eight, to strengthen the children ministry. In Africa, we have about 45% of uh, children that of, uh, of all the various nations below the age of 15. And so if you are talking of evangelizing, you have to talk of those, those children. And therefore you as an individual, you will take the ministry to the children very seriously 
preach the gospel to them. Number 10, the students' outreach. The youth. The people that are still in the secondary school. You will not neglect them. You will not say, well, they don't have money, they don't have anything they are going to supply to the church. You will labor on them. Number 10, women ministries. There are women you cannot reach as men. And therefore, you will train, you will release the women so that there will be women ministries. Number 11, literature and research ministries. Obviously, in communities where not many people are accustomed to reading, we need to use a lot of cases in the local languages to preach the gospel to them. Number 12, to systematically plant spiritually strong, lively, pure churches until your field of ministry is literally saturated with such vibrant vigorous churches that's the calling that god has given us that's the perception of the ministry god has called us to that you will plant churches that are strong churches that are faithful churches that believe in the word of god and that live by the word of god if this is what the lord has called us to the question we ought to be asking ourselves in this uh, congress is how much of it am i doing am i actually fulfilling the ministry this perception the lord has given me am i carrying each out we need to ask ourselves that question and we need to get on our knees in this congress so that all that we need to do we will do in the name of the lord point number two now power for the appointed ministry obviously you know that even you, if you have the perception the understanding of what ministry you are called to that's not enough we need the power of the lord and we praise the lord because the lord himself is standing behind the ministry that he has appointed he wants souls to be saved he wants churches to be planted. He wants the people of God to be matured. He is telling us that if we will do what he has called us to do, that he will support us in Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23, verses 13 and 14. But he is in one mind. And who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me. And many such things are with him. Obviously, when Job said those words, Job was talking about his own experience. And he was uh, limiting all this to his own experience. But then, as we read this in the context of the whole scripture, as we read these verses in the light of the whole revelation of God, you will see that this is applicable to the ministry he has called every one of us to. Now read it in the light of the rest of scripture. In verse 13, But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? We could have told Pharaoh that, would have told we could have told pharaoh there's no point resisting the lord the lord is of one mind you cannot stop him you cannot turn him you cannot alter his plan we could have told nebuchadnezzar that same thing we would have told him that the lord is of one mind you know and there is no point fighting against the will of god we could have told saul the same thing when he was fighting against the appointment of david and we could have said saul what's the point fighting because the lord is of one mind and who can alter his plan and we could have told those pharisees when jesus christ came to them he came to unto his own but his own received him not but as many as received him he gave them power to become the sons of god and he was saying we don't want this man we don't believe he is the messiah but jesus christ was the messiah and he said 
this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And we could have told the Pharisees, there's no point fighting that. The Lord is of one mind who can alter his plan. The same thing we can tell you. That in the country where you are, in the nation where you are, the state where you are, the region or the community where you are, the Lord wants the gospel to be preached there. And he has appointed you to do something there. It may be the people are kicking. It may be they are fighting against it. It may be there is opposition. It may be there is difficulty. And you are wondering what the Lord appointed me to do here. Maybe it will not be done. Maybe it cannot be done. We need to remind you, the Lord is of one mind. And who can turn him? And what his soul desires. He is not willing that anybody should perish. He wants the gospel to reach everyone. He wants members in the church to be developed and matured. And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. In verse 14, for he performeth the thing that is appointed for me. Discover that appointed ministry. And you will discover he has the power to fulfill that which has been appointed. In fact, many such things are with him. You must have a definite call from the Lord. Receive clear understanding of the details of ministry and be well taught, adequately trained, so that you'll be able to fit yourself into the plan of God for your life in ministry. But then understand, with all that you need divine enablement so that you'll be able to fulfill the ministry. Obviously, you know the scripture that says, without me, you can do nothing. And yet, remember the words of Jesus. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And of course, you'll need his enablement, so he joins with that part of the verse, and that whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And so we know that we can be enabled, energized, empowered by the Lord to do all that we need to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, here Paul the Apostle was telling the Corinthians, he said, what I'm doing is by the grace of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. He appointed me to the ministry. It might appear that there are difficulties there, heart aches there, but it's what he appointed me to. And therefore, because of that appointment, I am what I am by the grace of God. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. I pray you'll be able to say that. That the grace which he bestowed upon you for the appointed ministry, that you will not lose a single day, You'll not lose a single moment. You'll not allow some good things to cancel the best things of ministry from your life. He said, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And he is the one that told uh, the Philippians that we can do all things. Can we do all things? Through Christ that strengthens us. Therefore, we know that if we will get the power of the Lord by the grace of God, we'll be able to do what he calls us to do. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In Joshua chapter 1, Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, There shall no man be able to stand before thee, all the days of thy life. But I want you to realize, you see many times when we read the promises of God, we read the promises of God out of context. And we do not know the conditions that God attaches to the promise that he gives. We just read glibly, without thinking. There shall no man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. 
But my brothers and sisters, there's one condition there. It is presupposed here that this man Joshua will be moving on to the land of Canaan. On that basis, on that condition, in that ministry appointed for him, there shall be no man able to stand before him. What if he decided that he would rather go to Egypt? That promise cannot hold. What if he decided he will not cross Jordan? He'll stay over here on this side of Jordan. He'll be in the wilderness. He's not going to leave certainty for uncertainty. He'll stay back here where there's security and certainty. That promise will not be given to him. It is on the basis that every place the soul of your pure food shall tread upon. That have I given unto thee. Again, this is given to a marching Christian, to a moving Christian, to a walking Christian. Every place the soul of your foot shall tread upon. If you stay just in one place, that's all you get. If you don't go outside your room, outside your vicinity, that's all you get. But if you go to the appointed place, every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon in the appointed place. We need to understand that. So that you are not thinking, why is it God gave me this promise and it has not been fulfilled? Why is it you are staying at home? Why is it you are not knocking on those doors? Why is it you are not going to the regions beyond? Why is it we are not evangelizing? Why is it we are not marching and moving on? It is as we are marching and moving on that it says, Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon. Get into the appointed ministry and you'll see the power available for you. And it is on that basis he told Joshua, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life as I was with Moses when he moved out of the backside of the desert. Notice that. As I was with Moses when he went to the place I sent him. As, he, as I was with Moses when he forgot about all his fears and he went to Pharaoh and he declared the word of God. As I, went to, as I was with Moses at the point, at the post of duty, so will I be with thee. If you will be at the post of duty, on that condition, on that basis, I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And so you will see that the promise of the Lord is there. That he will back us up. He will support us. He will empower us to do what needs to be done. Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah 48. From verse 17, thus says the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches thee to profit. God doesn't teach anybody to fail. God doesn't teach anybody not to be a mediocre. He doesn't teach anybody how not to win souls. He teaches you to profit. When you get into the ministry as appointed for you, it doesn't matter your level of education. If that is a place God has called you to, and it doesn't matter whether you are a man or you are a woman, if that is a place he has appointed for you, he says, I am the one that teaches you to profit. If you will pray to him the right kind of prayer. If you will read your Bible or read it aright. If you will interpret the word you are reading in the Bible and interpret aright, it says, I will teach you to profit. Then it says, I'm the one that leadeth thee by the way thou should go. Thou shouldest go. And so you see, when he appoints you in the ministry, he also begins to map out for you. He begins to tell you the strategies and the methods and the things you will do so that you'll be able to do what he wants done. Oh, that thou art akin unto my commandments. Then at thy peace being as a river. Then at thy peace being as a river. You know, if we really follow the Lord, we shouldn't have hypertension in the ministry. If we really follow the Lord, we shouldn't have unnecessary heartache in the ministry. If we really follow the Lord and the method and the things that the Lord has lined for us, we shouldn't have unnecessary kind of uh, self-pity in the ministry. 
because he sees he even directs you he gives you the the map the, the the mapping and the strategy and the way you should go and then he says he is the righteous god that he will be able to is a righteousness and it will be like the waves of the sea then he says in verse 19 thy seed also had been as the sand if you had followed the lord your converts would have been as the sand. If you had listened to the strategies he gave you, if you were not abandoning the things he told you to do, if you were not arguing with what the Lord said, do it this way, do it this way, go this way, if you were not arguing, he said, your converts would have been as the sand for number. And thy offspring, the offspring of thy bowels, like the gravel thereof, his name should not have been cut off, nor destroyed from before me. You see, when God appoints a person and he sends you to the field, it may be to a Muslim environment. It may be to the people you don't even understand their language. It may be to a country uh, which is new and strange to you. If God has sent you there, and if you are doing what he wants you to do there, he says... Your name, your fruit, the result will not have been destroyed. You will not have been saying, I have nothing to show for my labor. It appears it's a hard place. The people here don't want the gospel. No, Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature. And I believe we can do it. And that's why we came this time, so that we can wait upon the Lord. Because... He still gives power to those who are faint. And to them that have no might, he's still increasing strength. The Bible says even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall do what? They renew their strength. And that's why we came together at this time. We want to come and renew our strength. So that the ministry he has given us to carry out will be able to carry it out in Jesus' name. For God's part to work in your life and in my life, here are things that will be necessary for you to do, for me to do. Number one, accept the appointed ministry. With all its challenges and difficulties, there will be challenges, there will be difficulties. If you are going to have the power of the Lord, for that appointed ministry, accept that appointed ministry with all its challenges and difficulties. Listen to this. We can succeed in a seemingly difficult ministry with God's grace and strength upon our lives while others fail in a relatively easier ministry without His grace and power. If God has given you a tough ministry, a difficult ministry, a hard land, stay there. Because you will achieve success. You will have success in a difficult place with the grace of God. Rather than searching for an easier assignment without the backing of God. That's how to have the power of God. Accept the appointed ministry. Number two, consecrate to endure. And do whatever it takes. And it's going to take much. Consecrate to endure. And to do whatever it will take to fulfill the appointed ministry. That will mean stand at your post. That will imply do the will of God faithfully. Without murmuring. Without complaining. Without seeking an easier duty. With less demands on sale. Number three, seek God's face and seek spiritual strength and power. Very often, we need to pray and fast. I want to repeat that because the 20th century Christians, they are forgetting fasting. But the first generation of the believers in the church. That is the first century church. 
They knew the power of praying and fasting. Jesus spoke about it in Matthew. And then you have it recorded in the Gospels. When you come into the Acts of the Apostles, you still also see fasting by ministers, members, corporately, individually, in the church. There was fasting. Also, when you read the epistles, you will see fasting. And if we're going to have all we need to have, we will need to seek the face of the Lord and seek the strength of the Lord by prayer and fasting. Number four, faithfully commit yourself to the preaching of the undiluted, unadulterated word of God. If you want to see success, preach the word. Preach it in season and out of season. Preach the whole truth, earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Don't say, well, I'll not talk about that aspect. I'll not talk about that aspect. We need the totality of the word of God. Preach the word. Faithfully commit yourself to preaching the undiluted, unadulterated word of God. Number five, manifest endurance and patience. Manifest endurance and patience. Can you see that great evangelist, Noah, preaching the word, telling them judgment will come. And he preached for so many years while building the ark of safety. And yet, only seven other people with himself making it. But he endured. He didn't give up. He kept on preaching that same word, the word of righteousness. And that's the thing we need. We need patience. You see, there are many people that are impatient. And they quit before the cloud turns to heavy rain of revival. They have been praying. They have been seeking the face of the Lord. They have been preaching. They have been developing strategies. All of a sudden, they just say, I don't think I can continue, I can continue here. Because no rain is falling. Because revival is not coming. The people are hard-hearted. They are not yielding to the gospel. Don't quit. Be patient. Because the Bible says, ye have need of patience. That after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Paul was writing to the Thessalonian believers, and he says so that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith. Patience and faith. You have faith in the Lord. You also have patience. And then we're told, you remember the story, the parable that Jesus told of the sow of the sea. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, he said, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit, how? With patience. You bring forth fruit with patience. And so it says, let patience have a perfect work. So we need to be patient as we are enduring in the difficulties of the ministry God has called us to. Point number three, perseverance in the appointed ministry. Perseverance in the wrong place will not yield any results. If you get out of the place where God has placed you, where God has spoken through Moses to put Joshua, or where God has spoken through Elijah to put Elisha, or where God has spoken through Samuel to put David, or where God himself has spoken through the church to put Barnabas and Saul. If you leave that appointed place of ministry because of the difficulties and you will not persevere, there is no guarantee you will be able to please the Lord. There is no guarantee the Lord will change his mind and say, well, all right, have my second alternative. If you are not going to have the first choice, there is nothing like that. He is of one mind. Who can turn him? Where, to, where he wants you to be, stay there. And you are going to persevere in the appointed ministry. If you are going to actually have success. Well, there is a lot we can read about this, but there is no time. But you know that all the people God gave us as examples in the Bible, they are to persevere. They are to stay right there where the ministry demanded every courage in them to be successful. 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. There are things that have the tendency of making us faint, but we faint not. It, it, it repeats that same concept in verse 16. It tells us in verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. It took perseverance on the part of Paul the Apostle, so that he'll be able to endure in that ministry to the very end. You see, there are people that judge the validity of the call of God for them into the ministry by whether there are difficulties or the people are easy to lead. But if you judge by the opposition, if you judge the ministry that God has called you to by the difficulties and the resistance from the people, if you judge by persecution, if you judge by the criticism, or if you are judging by the apparent failure you might have experienced, or the discouragement and the disappointment you have encountered in your calling on the field, your heart may question whether or not you are in the appointed ministry. But look through your Bible. Moses encountered delays and disappointments from the beginning to the very end of his ministry. But would you ever doubt it for a moment that Moses was in the appointed ministry? Oh yes, was. that ministry was divinely appointed for him. And yet there were delays and disappointments. The delays or the disappointments or the difficulties, they do not prove anything at all. They do not prove that you are not in the appointed ministry. In fact, it came to such a head, to such a climax in the ministry of Moses that he said unto the Lord, he said, Wherefore, as thou afflicted thy servant. He was talking about his ministry. He was talking about the appointment God has given him. He said, Wherefore, as thou afflicted thy servant, he said, Wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all these people upon me? Then he said in the following verse, Numbers 11, 14, I am not able. You see, sometimes it will appear that the burden and the load is crushing. And then somebody will be telling you, maybe this is not the appointed ministry. Because after all, if it were the appointed ministry, it will be much, much easier than this. That's not the voice of God. Even Moses said, I'm not able to bear all these people alone because it is too heavy for me. And yet it was the appointed ministry. Can I remind you that even Aaron was bereaved in the appointed ministry? God had called him to be the high priest. And he also called his sons to be priests along with him. And in the midst of that appointed ministry, he was bereaved of two of his sons in one single day. What are we to say? Are we then to say that that's not the appointed ministry? Because of the bereavement, the storm on the sea does not always mean that we're in the wrong boat. And the storm on the sea does not always show that we're going in the wrong direction. You remember when Jesus said on the same day at the evening, let us pass over unto the other side. And they sent away the multitude, and he took to the sheep. And then there were some other little sheep. And while they were in the sheep, there arose a great storm of wind. The Lord was there. The presence of the Lord was there. And the promise of the Lord was there. The decision, the purpose of the Lord was there. Let's go on to the other side. And yet there was a storm. In fact, it came to the point that the waves beat into the ship so that it was not full. What are we going to say from that? Did the Lord make a mistake when he said, let's pass over to the other side? No, don't judge by the difficulty. How about Joshua? He faced opposition of organized armies. And yet, God had appointed him and assigned him to the duties. You remember David? In his appointed ministry, he was rebuked by relatives. 
He was persecuted by the king. He was betrayed by his trusted counselor. He was deceived by his subordinates. He was ejected from the palace by his own son. He was even chastised and disciplined by Almighty God. And yet, in the midst of it, do you know, it was still in the appointed ministry. Yes, he had his faults. And because of that, he suffered. But it was still in that appointed ministry. Jeremiah suffered imprisonment and hatred from the very people he was ministering to. But it was in the appointed ministry. Talk about the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. They endured threatening, some beating, and imprisonment. And it was still in the appointed ministry. Before I close, let me give you this final example. Look at um, the life of Paul the Apostle. Here is the apostle that Almighty God himself testified about. And he said, he is a chosen vessel. I pray you'll be a chosen vessel. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, he met the Lord. And as he met the Lord, the Lord confirmed concerning this man that he was chosen by the Lord. Acts chapter 9 and verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Nobody could have had any appointed ministry more than that man, Paul the Apostle. He was in the appointed ministry. Were there difficulties in that appointed ministry? Trouble? Heartache? Whatever? That he was even telling the Lord, take this away from me? Oh yes. Look at a catalog of things he experienced and encountered in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. From verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. What he meant is, I shouldn't brag. But you, Corinthians, you are misjudging my ministry. You are misjudging that because he had all those stripes, all those difficulties, maybe he's not in the appointed ministry. He said, who are you going to talk about that has any appointed ministry more than me? Are they ministers of Christ? He said, bear with me if I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In strives, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, very often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty strives minus one. Thirty-nine. Three tries was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep as if I'll be drowned. In journeys often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. You know, some people might have said, if that is really the appointed ministry, those uh, thugs and all those uh, robbers, they will not have anything to do. He said, well, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, painfulness, Watchings, hunger, thirst, fasting, cold, nakedness. And yet, he was in the appointed ministry. Here we are tonight. The devil might have been whispering to your mind, saying, maybe I missed my way. Maybe I'm not in the right place. Maybe all these difficulties are telling me that I missed the ministry. No, don't you see Jesus Christ himself? He said very many times over and over and over again that the father that sent him was always with him. Did he have difficulties? Oh yeah, to the point of crucifixion. It's not different today. Those difficulties, the devil fighting the ministry, fighting your progress, shows that there is something that is going to come out of that ministry. And the Lord will fulfill that ministry in Jesus' name. 
the calling the Lord is giving us is that despite all the difficulties, despite all the problems, we're going to seek the Lord during this Congress and we're going to have, number one, a proper perception of the ministry has called us to a deeper perception of the ministry has given us. Number two, we're going to seek the power of God. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem where Christ was crucified, and also in Judea where he went, and yet he lamented on them that if the miracles were, that were done in all, the, in all those places had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have remained. You'll go back there to that same place. Your ministry is there. You'll even go to Samaria where he was rejected. When he wanted to pass through the village and they said, no, you're not going to pass through this place. And you'll go to the uttermost part of the earth where you don't understand their culture, their language. If you will seek the power of God during this Congress, I believe that your ministry and everything around you will be transformed in Jesus' name. And then you'll have the perseverance to stay at your post of duty. You will never look back. You are going to say, I know God has appointed me. I know I have only one life to live. And that life will be lived to the glory of God. And whatever problems or difficulties I'm experiencing in this place, this is the place the Lord has sent me. And I'm going to be there. And I'm going to do everything he wants me to do. There is no alternative. I'm not going to run away from there. I'm not going to say I'm looking for easier ground. I will be here and do everything the Lord wants me to do. I believe the Lord will help you. If you are getting tired, it will strengthen you. If you are weary, it's encouraging you. And if you have lost hope, the Lord is your hope. If it appears you are weak and there is no strength, during this Congress, I believe they will energize and empower you in Jesus' name. I hope you are not too tired to pray tonight. Are you tired to pray? Let's rise up then and talk to the Lord. Do you have a better perception of that ministry? And do you know you, you need the power of God to be able to fulfill that ministry? And do you make up your mind? Are you making up your mind? You are going to persevere, persevere, endure in that ministry until everything he wants you to do is done. Talk to the Lord. Lay your life before the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I'm going to serve you. Yes, Lord, I'm not going to look at those difficulties. At those disappointments. I'm not going to look at all the things the devil is trying to whisper in my ears. And I'm not going to worry about those who are there, those who are not there. I am going to be faithful at my point of duty. Whatever happened in the ministry where God has placed you, whatever difficulties you have experienced, you see the case of Moses, you see the case of Aaron, you see the case of Joshua, you see the case of David, you see the case of Daniel, you see the case of Jeremiah, you see that of Ezekiel, you see that of Isaiah, you see that of the apostles of the Lord, you see that of Paul, you see, the, you see it also in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He endured in that ministry. He did what the Lord wanted him to do. And Paul at the end of the ministry said, I have fought a good fight. It was a fight from Damascus unto Jerusalem, unto Iconium, unto Antioch, everywhere. But I fought. But I fought. I didn't run away from the battlefield. I fought. I have fought a good fight. I fought against sin. I fought against the flesh, I fought against the false prophets, I fought in the palace, I fought on the field. I fought it on the sea, I fought it on the land. I fought it in the prison, I fought it in the house. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I finished it up, I fulfilled it, I carried it out, I have finished. I have finished. I have finished. He didn't run away before the end of the battle. He proclaimed the word. He preached the word. He did the will of the Lord. Are you running away? Are you running away? 
Your location is difficult. Your territory is hard. The people are resistant. Not enough money there. You don't have the favor of the people. Is that an excuse? Is that an excuse? Why don't you surrender your life to the Lord? I'll be at my post. I'll be a soldier. I will even die at my post. I'll be a soldier of Jesus Christ, a true soldier of the cross. A true soldier of the cross. If I have to die there, I will die at my post. Persevere. Persevere. Only one life. Only one life. Only one life. Dedicate that single life to the appointed ministry. Preach the gospel. Teach the totality of the truth of the word of God. Go on doing it. Keep on doing it. Stay at it. Until you fulfill the ministry. Fulfill the ministry. You will pray in the day. You will pray in the night. You will fast sometimes for days. You will fast. You will not allow the pleasure of the flesh. Food. Convenience. Sleeping. To hinder you from getting the power of God. You will wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Have you forgotten how to fast? Are you now used to eating and eating and eating that you don't remember that those who are going to take the kingdom will take it by violence? When last did you fast? When last did you pray? Pray in agony. Pray with fervency. Pray with consecration. Pray stretching yourself upon the altar. Like Isaac was stretched upon the altar. The Lord has called you. Like he called Esther. If you all together hold your peace and you keep quiet at this time, then shall enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows? And who knows? And who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows? Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Do what he wants you to do. Do what he has called you to do. Don't allow anything to sidetrack you. Don't allow the people of the world to tell you, if uh, this is the appointed ministry, why all the trouble? Why all the suffering? Why all the need? Why all the poverty? Why all the lack? Stay there. Stay there. Stay there. Commit yourself to that ministry until the ministry is fulfilled. The Lord is saying to you, take it to the ministry. Which